Charlotte City. Mm -hmm. I can't. I was going to introduce her. That would be, oh, that would be really nice. So she she'll shield rise. Wherever she is, she'll rise. Yeah. I know, I just, I thought if I could locate her beforehand, it'd be easier for me. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege once again to welcome you to the fourth of our five-day series of the Symposium on Nuclear War, The Dangers and Realities. I would be remiss once again if I did not uh, recognize those who really have made this uh, possible. I said that on Monday, but some of you are new that we're not here. I work very closely with the student government at North Idaho College. And under the leadership this year of Jim Brewer, the president, and now Lee Cole, the new president, and all the student board members, they've worked so closely with me uh, and been so supportive, and they funded this entire symposium. And not only do they fund the symposium, but they give me such moral support at those hours of times when it's needed so badly, uh, when it gets rough and we get tired. Once again, I'm going to ask you to let's show our appreciation to the student government at North Idaho College. On today's program, following this morning's speech, I would like to inform you that we will have another response panel. Today's panel will be at 1 p.m. in the Student Union Building in the Bonner Room, and it will be in response to this speech this morning. We will show our final film of the week this afternoon, 2 at 2.30, and the title of that film is The Day After Trinity. May I also inform you that for you who have not been able to come each day or you have friends who could not come, starting the last Sunday of May and going through all the month of June, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on Channel 7 KSPS in Spokane, we will have interviews with our major keynote speakers. And you can see what we asked them when it was somewhat different from the presentations. And we hope you will view those programs. It is my privilege today to introduce the person that will be in charge and introduce our speaker, a friend of mine who's been at North Idaho College many years, He's been very active in the community, and he is the assistant director of the vocational school at North Idaho College, and I must say very supportive of such programs as the lecture series, and has assisted me in getting speakers in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Bob Brown. Good morning. Our speaker this morning is Dr. James R. McGrath. He has been a physician in pediatrics since 1950, and presently works at the Bellevue Clinic in Bellevue, Washington. Dr. McGrath has a bachelor's degree from Doan College in Crete, Nebraska, an honor he shares, by the way, with his wife, Charlotte, who is in the audience today. And, and I'd like to ask Mrs. McGrath to stand up. Very happy you could come with us. <clears throat> in addition to, to the McGraths attending that institution, we also have a local touch in that Wes Hatch, who is the director of our student union, and his wife Meg, who are also in the audience, also attended Doan College with the McGraths, were friends with them, and have kept touch with them over the years, and are with us today, and welcome the uh, Hatches as well. <clears throat> Dr. McGrath then went on to obtain a BS, an MD degree, from the University of Chicago. He is been active in the National Organization of Physicians for Social Responsibility. I understand that he got involved in this organization when his nine-year-old son came to him one day and said that he was afraid he was not going to live to be 19. And with that comment from his son, Dr. McGrath apparently at that point decided that it was perhaps time that he did something to ensure that his son would in fact reach 19 and became active in the organization uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility. 
While Dr. McGrath was at Doan College, uh, he shared an interest that I have. He was a member of the Doan Players, a thespian troupe that played all over the state of Nebraska. One of the plays in which he played the lead was the popular Our Town by Thornton Wilder. Fortunately for us, Dr. McGrath has now chosen to be a force in our town, which includes the whole world. Dr. McGrath. Thank you, Bob, and Tony, and Wes, and everyone who had a part in, in making this um, symposium come to be. It isn't easy to turn one's attention from the beauty of, of the day outside, the beauty of this town and this gem of a campus to come in to listen to this kind of, of rather grim uh, material. And yet one does sometimes need to turn one's attention to the hideous in order to preserve the beautiful. This subject is, of course, the most important single issue of our time, because however worthy other interests and issues and causes may be, they won't even exist if we don't get a handle on this one. And you recognize this by your thoughtful five-day symposium, uh, and all of you are to be commended. Had you attended one of the Target Seattle meetings last fall, we had a, a similar kind of symposium for the entire city of Seattle uh, last fall. One of the things you would have heard was um, about the day after the nuclear holocaust, the day when all was quiet over a cinder of ashen rubble, and nothing moved on the surface, but deep down, deep down in a crevice, in the earth were two amoebae left, and they slowly and laboriously made their way to the surface and looked about them. And one said to the other, well, there's nothing for it but to start all over again. And the other one said, all right, but this time, no brains. If we could have the first slide then. The topic does not lend itself to humor awfully well. Even the, uh, even the cartoonists have a hard time with this one. Can we, can we get the lights? Yeah. There are many ways of looking at the nuclear threat. Uh, one can look at it from a military, um, from a political, from a diplomatic, from a philosophical, an ethical, a religious, sociologic, demographic, psychological uh, viewpoint. But today we will address the medical consequences of nuclear war. Much of what you will look at today is not new to you, um, but it is fundamental fundamental information on which all the other discussions must rest. This is the bottom, bottom line. It's not difficult to outline the facts, but it is nearly impossible to really comprehend events which have no, no precedent in human experience. Uh, Lewis Thomas, author of Lives of a Cell, known to many of you, I'm sure, said recently, Words like disaster and catastrophe are too frivolous for the events that would follow a war with thermonuclear weapons. Damage is not the real term. The language has no word for it. Some people might survive, but survival itself is the wrong word. If we turn to the events of August 6th and 9th, 1945 at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, the only time atomic weapons have been used on cities, these two do not form a precedent. For one thing, they were, again, to use Lewis Thomas's words, only primitive precursors of what we have at hand today, relatively feeble instruments, even rather quaint technological antiques like Tiffany lamps, they were indeed nothing but puffs compared to what we now possess. The uh, 
power of the Hiroshima bomb was estimated at equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT, and with the resultant firestorm, it destroyed 4.7 square miles in the center of the city, killed 70,000 people, and left another 70,000 injured or missing. These were the immediate acute effects. In contrast, a relatively modest device in today's uh, arsenal, a one megaton bomb, has explosive power equal to 70 Hiroshima bombs. We're talking about one million tons of TNT, enough to fill a freight train 200 miles long, exploding in one place at one time. And if we talk about a 20 megaton bomb, we're trying to conceive of 20 million tons of TNT, equivalent of 1,400, 1,400 Hiroshima bombs exploding in one place at one time. If you can imagine that kind of death and injury and suffering on a scale unknown to our species. For Hiroshima and Nagasaki, help could eventually arrive, but in any likely all out exchange today, there would be no help from the outside because other areas would be similarly involved. Um, in the nuclear explosion, the effects are due to blast, heat, and radiation. And parenthetically, over at the side, EMP, electromagnetic pulse. It's over on the side not because it's unimportant, but because it has no known health consequences. It refers to a, an exceedingly powerful very brief flash of energy which is able to uh, eliminate, put out of order, all kinds of electronic uh, equipment, radio sending, uh, radio receiving equipment, telephone systems, communication gear, uh, computers, uh, and so on. Blast creates a shock wave of luminous, superheated, compressed air traveling at supersonic speed like a wall, crushing skyscrapers and bridges and houses and freight trains and automobiles and people, everything in its path. And this is spoken of as static overpressure, measured in pounds per square inch, ruptures eardrums, ruptures lungs. And this is followed by winds, dynamic pressure, <clears throat> up to several hundred miles an hour that also collapse structures uh, pick up, uh, uh, in addition, pieces of debris, pieces of buildings and trees and automobiles and people, and hurl them against anything in the path at speeds of well over 100 miles an hour. Heat thermal radiation comes first after a nuclear explosion. A one megaton airburst creates a fireball a mile and a half in diameter in less than a second. And with this comes an enormous heat flash <clears throat> traveling nearly at the speed of light, before the blast actually, burning people and buildings and their contents and producing third degree burns at five miles and second degree burns at six miles, first degree burns up to seven miles, and retinal burns in anyone who spontaneously looks at this bright flash in the sky and focuses it through the lens, retinal burns and blindness up to 12 miles and with a 20 megaton bomb up to 35 miles. And with this comes ignition of gas stations and fuel lines, fuel dumps, storage tanks, auto gas tanks, natural gas mains, a multiplicity of such which ignite and or explode. Firestorms are mass fires that burn everything in their paths, last for hours or days with convection in the center pulling in cool air from the periphery and reaching temperatures of 800 to 1,000 degrees centigrade, enough to melt steel and glass and to exhaust available oxygen. The fires are also driven by high winds. The world has seen four such firestorms with conventional bombing in World War II, Dresden and Hamburg, and of course in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The experience was that the only survivors were those who left their shelters, since unless these are very deep with specific thermal insulation and a self-contained independent oxygen supply, they simply become ovens which simultaneously asphyxiate and roast their occupants. Radiation, <clears throat> acute, oh, momentarily will, uh, this is an ordinary two-story frame house at the lower left corner begins the bright uh, initial flash 
Within uh, hundredths of a second, that side of the house bursts into flame, continues around clockwise, and you begin then to see some of the blast effect going on around to the destruction by both blast and, and heat. Radiation, um, acute exposure is very difficult to predict because so much depends on weather and wind conditions and on whether it is a ground burst or an air burst. And someone at 10 miles may receive minimal doses and someone 100 miles an hour may have lethal doses with a ground burst and a modest wind. Medically, what we're faced with then is massive trauma in incomprehensible number and mixture of crush injuries and ruptured internal organs, skull fractures and penetrating wounds of the chest and abdomen, fractures of the spine and long bones, deep lacerations, massive hemorrhage and shock, massive third and second degree burns, radiation syndromes, confusion, vomiting and diarrhea, bleeding and loss of immunity. Uh, let's look in more specific terms then at a one megaton airburst at 8,000 feet over a city. This happens because that's where I am to be the Seattle area and this is over Boeing Field <coughs> in Seattle. The inner circle, nearly a mile in diameter, has uh, 20 to 100 pounds per square inch overpressure and uh, everything, 470 mile an hour winds, everything within that circle is vaporized instantly and no longer exists. The next circle, which is a three mile diameter, 10 pounds per square inch overpressure, 300 miles an hour uh, winds, destruction of most major buildings and lesser buildings are simply distributed about as debris. The other five, the next circle is five miles, five pounds per square inch overpressure, 160 mile per hour winds. Houses and light commercial buildings are destroyed and heavier buildings are severely damaged. At um, uh, six miles, three pounds per square inch, 95 mile an hour winds. Wall walls are blown away from steel frames and there's severe damage to houses. Winds kill people in the open. And the outer 12 mile diameter circle one pound per square inch over pressure. One pound doesn't sound like very much because as you know, we have 14 pounds uh, per square inch on our skins all the time, it's atmospheric pressure. But think for a moment of a, of a little pane of glass, 10 by 10, 100 square inches, and suddenly applied to this little pane of glass is 100 pounds of force. So of course it shatters. Half a pound per square inch is plenty to shatter windows, all glass objects, and turn them into slivers and shards of glass which are driven at high force and speed into whatever is there. Um, again, oh, this is a, um, this is a 20 uh, megaton burst over downtown Seattle. The inner circle again is vaporized within the next circle, 100% fatality from blast and uh, heat and the uh, outer circle, 50% of all the people within that will die of blast, heat, or combinations thereof. This is leaving out of account, of course, radiation so far. Now, a one megaton airburst over our city on a weekday working hours, say three o'clock in the afternoon, with resulting firestorm, <clears throat> will kill 36% of the 1,213,000 people in the metropolitan area 440,000 people outright will seriously injure and incapacitate another 30%, 360,000. And so two-thirds of the population, 800,000 casualties, either dead or seriously injured by a single, relatively small one megaton airburst. And at least 10,000 of the survivors will have massive third-degree burns. We in Seattle have two, have um, 40 f uh, burn beds available in the city and could take care of, in a massive catastrophe, 25 acute severe burns at once. In the entire United States, there are somewhere between two and 3,000 burn beds, and acute severely burned patients, the capacity would be 250 to 300 for the entire country that could be cared for at one time. Um, over Seattle, a single 20 megaton air burst, same conditions with resulting firestorm, would kill outright 1,090,000 people, 90% of the population, and all the rest, 124,000, will be seriously injured and incapacitated, 100% total 
casualties. To bring it a little closer to home, I stopped in uh, Spokane, borrowed a slide from one of the pediatricians there. Um, this is, uh, these are the circles of destruction over downtown Spokane. You know the uh, landmarks better than I. Uh, the second uh, circle to the left is Fairchild Air Force Base, um, which has, of course, not only sack bombers, but does have missiles at this point also. The uh, two targets in the immediate vicinity that are not on this are uh, Kaiser Mead, is that correct? Kaiser Mead, and then that's to the north, and of course, 15 miles over to the east, the other Kaiser plant. I wish that I could, uh, could say to you that Coeur d'Alene is, is free of trouble. Um, we know that all cities of 25,000 and above are targeted and you escape that. I wish I could say that you escape everything. As far as blast and heat, you probably would have relatively little damage. As far as radiation goes, it, as I say, is hard to predict, but you're close enough, so a great deal of what came from the bomb would be within fractions of a second exploded and expanded out close to you and the prevailing westerly winds, of course, would carry it uh, fairly massively over, over this uh, community, too. One has to remember, also, what happened when uh, Mount St. Helens uh, exploded with a six megaton uh, burst. Um, this, this reminds you of what the prevailing wind flow is from the Hanford area. One needs to know, also, that a nuclear bomb exploding in a nuclear reactor increases the damage by 1,000 times. So that, that the devastation in the Hanford area, which of course is a prime, prime target, would be, would be unbelievable and the uh, fallout uh, undoubtedly would, would come your way. So you are not isolated from the world, unfortunately. We uh, sometimes... Uh, a one megaton airburst over Spokane, same conditions as we talked about, 67% of the people in Spokane would die immediately, 170,000 people, 20%, 52,000 would be seriously injured and incapacitated, 87% of the metropolitan population would be killed or seriously injured. A 20 megaton airburst would kill 98% of the, 200, of the uh, population. 250,000 people would die immediately, and all the rest would be seriously injured and incapacitated. Uh, again, returning to our area, this is, this is the targeting of a MIRV. A MIRV, which you hear about, are the initials the, of, of a multiple warhead, independently targetable reentry vehicle. And this is 10 warheads targeted on military objectives in our area. The Trident Base at Bangor, Fort Lewis, McCord Field, Bremerton Naval Shipyards, Boeing Field, Payne Field, Downtown Boeing, SeaTac, Renton Boeing. In this case, only 22% of the people would be killed, 270,000 people. And it's interesting to see how one changes one's language. It becomes only 22%. 880,000 would be severely injured and incapacitated, 70%, a total of 92%. So much for the delusion that people living in other areas sometimes have that a militarily targeted attack would have few serious consequences for them. Now, if this glut of statistics hasn't dulled all meaning of figures for you, let me give you the estimates of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War of the United States and Soviet combined casualties in an all-out exchange. More than 200 million men, women, and children would die immediately, and 60 million would be left severely injured and incapacitated. If we turn then from the impersonal quality of uh, figures to the reality of what happens on the ground, uh, these, of course, are pictures uh, taken in Hiroshima after the bomb burst. And we'll run through these relatively quickly without too much comment. These black and white photos were taken by a friend of Dr. Rick Rapor, a neurosurgeon in Seattle. He was sent into the area three weeks after the bombing. 
and uh, took these with a uh, brownie camera, sometimes called an atomic desert. He died in 1969 of leukemia. This bomb was estimated at 15,000 tons of TNT compared to what we're talking about, one million tons. This was the scene at the Mayuku Bridge, 11:15 uh, on August 6, 1945, uh, three hours after the uh, bombing. As we said, help could come to these two cities. These are not good slides, but these are third-degree burns. Likewise, the back of a lady with third degree burns. Late effects of radiation, hair falling out. Young man on his way someplace that morning. And perhaps the most poignant of all, this person was ascending the steps as the bomb burst, and all that remains is the shadow of the person glazed into the surface of the stone as he or she was vaporized. Let's, um, let's look briefly at the acute radiation picture. <clears throat> this is a one megaton ground burst on the Bremerton shipyards with our also usually westerly flow of wind. And I don't know how many of you were able to, to have a copy of the uh, handout which deals with Spokane. Um, and on the back, on, on one side of that, are um, uh, fallout diagrams also. I'm sorry it doesn't extend farther east so you can see. Um, everyone within the inner ellipse, and this is true on, on the handouts if you have them too, Within the inner ellipse, everyone receives 4,000 radiation units, 4,000 REMS, and would die uh, very quickly, uh, if, if not already dead, of blast and heat. The next uh, ellipse encloses 1,000 REMS. Everyone within that area would die within a matter of a few hours of radiation damage. And the outer ellipse encloses 4, uh, 400 rems, which is the LD50. Half the people within the outer ellipse would die within a matter of a few weeks. People farther removed may survive <coughs> with nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and confusion and acute bleeding disorders, suppression of immune mechanisms with increased susceptibility to infection, and eventually an increased chance of leukemia and cancers of the thyroid and breast and lungs, and after years, uh, increased incidence of cancers of intestinal and urinary tracts also. Um, this is the distribution of hospitals in our metropolitan area. They tend to cluster in the hypothetical target zone. Spokane has four hospitals. Uh, the results probably would be somewhat similar. We have 9,483 beds in the metropolitan area. <clears throat> there are something over 1,000 uh, beds in Spokane. And with a one megaton airburst plus the resulting firestorm, 82% of these would be destroyed or unusable. And with a 20 megaton burst, 100%. Uh, in our area, there are about 3,700 physicians. Uh, I presume that in the uh, Spokane area, this would be more like 1,000. And of our 3,700, fewer than 1,000 would survive and be able to function. So I presume if something similar occurred in Spokane, it would mean that you would have perhaps 200 or 250 physicians. Uh, if we say that there, it's estimated that there will be about 1,700 survivors to each surviving physician. If we are a little more conservative, make it easier for him, and say a thousand survivors to each physician, and if each physician uh, sees each patient for only 10 minutes and works 20 hours a day, it will take eight days in our area to see all of the patients once, and it would take uh, two or three days in Spokane to see each person only once. 
And this, of course, includes physicians of all ages and all areas of training and all levels of health. And it assumes that they would all be willing to uh, expose themselves to radiation in full measure. And it assumes that they would spend no time on the mildly injured or the uninjured uh, or those who were ill from other causes. And all of this goes on where there is no electricity and no remaining transportation system. As Dr. Jack Geiger says, what is left of the buildings <clears throat> is lying in what is left of the streets. Bridges are gone. There's no effective communication system. There are no ambulances and no hospitals. And during that 10-minute visit, care must be given without pain medications, without antibiotics or other drugs, and without x-rays or other laboratory and diagnostic helps, and without blood or plasma or fluids, without operating rooms, or without hospital beds. In short, it's clear to everyone here that this is not medical care at all. This is bizarre absurdity. And we need to see this as illustrative of what would happen in all the other functions of our society. Not only do we lose, in a few moments time, few minutes time, all the support structure of communication and transportation and power and shelter and food and water, but all the complex network of human enterprises which these physically sustain. In one hour, at one hour of one day, the whole social, commercial, political and administrative, intellectual and artistic fabric of our common life is gone. And any population-targeted attack would involve many multi-megaton weapons. We've singled out one single megaton in order to be able to talk about it. But this is unrealistically conservative. And with the destruction of the social and emotional fabric of our lives, Survival, it has been said, is in purely biologic terms and would bear no resemblance to our previous lives. Nikita Khrushchev once noted, several years ago, that in these circumstances, the survivors would envy the dead. Thousands more would die each week of radiation sickness and infection. Insect vectors of disease are more resistant to radiation effects than we and <clears throat> would proliferate rapidly, adding to the spread of epidemics across a landscape of decomposing human and animal corpses and ashen rubble. Whatever food remained would be rapidly depleted and no new supplies would be coming. Severe water shortages would develop immediately. We average 50 gallons per person per day in this country. We would be down on an average to a pint per person per day, and we would have no way of knowing if this were safe water or not. Late effects include the increased incidence of malignancy and, and genetic mutations. And for those who happen to be unlucky enough to be in utero at this time, uh, later impaired growth and development and microcephaly and mental retardation. This was the experience with the children born after Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, bombings. The effect on weather is debated, but it is likely that nitrogen oxides formed from the air by the heat of the explosion and injected into the stratosphere by the force of it would help to break down ozone into molecular oxygen. And with the loss of significant amounts of ozone, even as much as just 20% of the ozone layer lost, ultraviolet radiation would become more intense with cancer-forming effect on our skins and eventual blindness from corneal damage. Blindness not only to humans, but to day-living and land-dwelling animals. And of course, a blind animal is a dead animal with a major interruption in the food chain and the ecosystem. Longer half-life radioisotopes would diffuse through the stratosphere, slowly enveloping the planet and slowly re-entering the biosphere to become part of the water-earth food cycle, poisoning for eons this fragile vessel from which we take our beings. Why sketch out these horrors for ourselves? Well, make no mistake, the technology does exist to bring this cataclysmic scene to pass, the magic fire and the death of the gods. In 1945, the entire nuclear arsenal of the world consisted of two, perhaps three, 
bombs. We have now so progressed that we have, there are, there are in the world 55,000, estimated to be 55,000 nuclear devices, roughly 30,000 in U.S. hands and 20,000 in, in Soviet hands and the rest elsewhere, and five or six more are being added each day. In 1979, the U.S. had 6,441 megaton equivalents, approximately half of them on alert, ready to launch within minutes. 400 megaton equivalents would kill 35 percent of the Russian people and effectively neutralize Russia militarily. As a matter of fact, a well-planned 200 megaton attack would uh, uh, also uh, kill uh, one-fifth of the population and destroy two-thirds of their industry. We had at that time 6,441. This, I don't know how well you can see this, this is a, a diagram which has multiple little dots in multiple little squares. In the center is a square with only one dot. That dot represents all the firepower exploded in the Second World War equivalent of three megatons for the entire war. Every other dot on the diagram represents three megatons and represents the amount that the world has now stockpiled and ready to use. Down in the, uh, up in the um, upper uh, left-hand corner is a tiny circle enclosing three, enclosing three dots. This is the amount of firepower, nine megatons, on a Poseidon submarine. And this is enough to destroy the major cities of Russia. Uh, in the lower left corner is a little circle with eight dots, 24 megatons. And this is the firepower of a Trident submarine, uh, enough to destroy all of the um, uh, major and uh, middle size cities and most of the military potential of Russia. Uh, the entire square is 18,000 megatons, enough to reduce all of the cities of the world to rubble several times over. The uh, slide projector could be off then, and the lights up if you'd like. Our military spending last year was, um, two years ago, was $300,000 per minute, $400 million per day. And we're increasing this on a monumental scale. The request at present is for $1.5 trillion over the next five years, $1.9 trillion over the next six years, $1 million a day for, just, it's hard to, to uh, conceive of what these figures possibly can mean. But if you started 2,000 years ago at the birth of Christ to spend $1 million a day, and you did this every day for the last 2,000 years, you would be only half through that amount of money. Uh, this is equivalent of $300 billion per year, over $800 million a day, and over $30 million an hour. <clears throat> 78% of all the discretionary spending of the federal budget goes to pay for the military. I emphasize the discretionary spending, the amount which, about which there is any choice. The arms race seems almost to have gained a life of its own and to be spinning into a mad, wild dance toward planetary death. Albert Einstein said the splitting of the atom has changed everything save our mode of thinking. You've probably heard this three times so far this week, but it's nonetheless true. And thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. The danger is that our racial memory is dimming and the bombs like those that stupefied the world and convinced everyone there could never be another world war begin now to be spoken of as though they are simply conventional armaments, 1980s version. We hear talk of tactical nuclear weapons and battlefield-sized warheads. Our top level planning is done by people trained in pre-atomic times when the more armaments you had, the more secure you were. At this point, the more arms that are added through the pile, which we just saw diagrammed, the more vulnerable we all become. 
At the highest circles of government, we hear of nuclear war being survivable. Vice President Bush has spoken of a winnable nuclear war. And there is extensive planning for dealing with a limited nuclear war, but, but no one has yet shown how such a war could be limited as long as either side saw itself to be losing. I think it's clear to everyone here that there can be no medical response to all-out nuclear war, that this is the ultimate and final epidemic, and that the only conceivable hope lies in prevention. The seeming inevitability of movement toward conflict has made us feel hopeless, and the immensity of the terror <clears throat> has made us turn away in denial and immobility. But the time of truth is hard upon us, and we must either slip silently toward the loss of everything that's had meaning in our turbulent, hard, sweet human journey, or join the work which may force the world's leaders to turn seriously toward peace. There is a ferment in the world, a wide, low stirring of people unwilling to acquiesce in their own demise, sensing the power of a common purpose more primal than war, common survival. As a species, we have proved wondrously innovative and adaptable. There's little doubt with what we would find ways to avoid our final destruction if the truth of our peril were made real to enough people in time. And all of us have to join the labor of educating ourselves and our fellows. Nothing else that we have worked for or cared about or dreamed of means anything if the final chapter of human history is to be written in nuclear suicide. It would be unkind and inhumane if I were to stop at that point. And we will talk about the possible responses to this overwhelming dilemma. But first, there is a proven medical fact, and that is that after 20 minutes of sitting, all the blood in the body drains from the cerebral hemispheres to the two hemispheres on which one rests. <laughs> and it is impossible then to think further. So I would like to invite you to stand for one minute. Don't go. The best is yet to come. Stand for one minute and stretch, talk, rejuvenate. Which one of these goes to the, <clears throat> to the PA system? I believe it. Here, let's see. This goes. This, this must, must be. That's the one. This one. Yeah. That's right. This is the mic that you're using for the yeah, auditorium. Okay. Hi, Elaine. A grizzly bear coming down the path full tilt at us, and we tend to stand there. What are the roadblocks to action? Let's go through these and see if you can recognize yourself. I recognize myself very well in many of these. Number one, unreality. Anything as overwhelming as this simply seems unreal, unbelievable. And we live these days a double life. At the same time that, that we know in the back of our beings that at any moment of the day, all of this could disappear, we still have to go about our daily lives. We get up in the morning and we shower and shave and go to the office or we do whatever we have to do as though this didn't exist. Um, we have to do this, just in terms of, of keeping ourselves going, surviving. And yet, it is a double life. And the price of this, in terms of emotional energy, is such that if it were released, the creative benefits would be tremendous for the world and for the individual. So number one, unreality. Number two, denial. Nobody's going to be crazy enough to push the button. 
It's too awful to think about. Adaptation. When anything is around long enough, it doesn't matter how terrible it looks. One gets used to it. I know that if I fail to finish painting one side of one room at home and it sits there after a while, I don't see it. One gets used to it. Assimilation, uh, assimilation. It's same as the old weapons. We begin simply to, to uh, make it equivalent to what we have known as, as a race, as a human race. Ethnocentricity, the sociologic term, which means that each side ascribes to itself all the good characteristics and behaviors and beliefs, and to the other side, all of the bad characteristics and behaviors and beliefs. We all do this to some extent, of course. But one saw the most recent example of this when Mr. Reagan spoke in Florida, and he spoke of the fact that all evil is concentrated within the Soviets. Uh, distancing, button pushing. It gets so much easier to talk of how many tens of millions of deaths are acceptable when one is removed from it. Roger Fisher, who is a law professor at Harvard or Yale, I can't remember which, um, had a fantasy about how one could overcome this button-pushing distance. You know that when the president uh, travels, well, when he doesn't travel, at all times, there is one member of one of the four branches of the armed services close to him carrying what's spoken of as the black box, a case within which are the codes necessary to launch whatever level of nuclear response uh, or attack the president would deem advisable at that time. And if this comes to that point, he turns to the aide who opens the case, hands him the codes, he picks up the red telephone, says XYZ 2423D, and it is done. Well, Roger Fisher's uh, fantasy was that instead of carrying a case, a volunteer would have the codes implanted next to its, his or her heart and would carry at all times a large and very sharp knife. And if the president needed the codes, he would have to retrieve them from the volunteer who would have willingly said that this is what I will do uh, and would hand the president the knife. When he told this to his friends in the Pentagon, they were aghast. Blood on the White House carpet. They said, <laughs> they said he might never push the button. Armageddon, ecstasy in Holocaust. It was estimated in an article in the Atlantic a, a few months ago that in this country, there are over a million people who very sincerely uh, and without question believe that we are approaching the end of history, that this is the prophesied time uh, when good and evil will clash and uh, good will triumph over evil, uh, Christ against Antichrist, and that the nuclear holocaust is a culmination to be devoutly wished for. Outmoded assumptions, old beliefs such as which we may still cling to, such as that war is winnable, or that war is survivable, nuclear war, or that war can now still be an instrument of politics or a mechanism for settling disputes. A sense of impotence, and I think this is one of the strongest perhaps of all. What can an ordinary person do? Leave it to the experts. They know so much that we don't know, and they have all of the basis for coming to a judgment. They must be able to decide the right thing. This is beyond the expertise of anyone. You and I have exactly as much right to think about this, to come to conclusions, and to act toward our own survival as anyone else on Earth. As a matter of fact, the experts, many of you are not old enough perhaps to recall what the Maginot Line was, but after the First World War, the French decided that they were never again going to be overrun by Germany. <clears throat> they constructed a massive line across their borders concrete, deep tunnels, pillboxes with machine guns, tank traps, um, mined, um, filled with explosives, and they were ready. They knew that they couldn't be overrun. Well, 
Critics, this is a quote from a column by Emmett Watson in the Seattle Times. Critics of the MX missile system should be ashamed of themselves, declares historian Arthur Bester. The same harsh things could, were said about the Maginot Line while it was being built, that it was foolish, costly, probably wouldn't work. In fact, it represented the best thinking of the French defense establishment, and it embodied the latest military technology. Think what would have happened to France in 1940 had she been without it. <laughs> how, how to proceed? There is no best action and no best set of actions. And I think it's important to know that nobody is in charge and nobody is going to tell you what to do. And it's important to know that you don't have to know everything in order to proceed. Because if you did, I wouldn't be up here. Inform yourselves. And of course, you are by being here today. And I'm preaching to the converted um, rather than to those who should inform themselves. But there are many, many books, multiple books, easily readable, filled with the information that you need. Uh, there are many publications. Um, listed in some handouts, which I'm afraid I didn't have enough for everyone to get, but which will be available through you uh, to you through Tony uh, in one way or another. So inform yourselves, join one or more organizations, and commit time, perhaps as a starter, 5% of your discretionary time, two hours a week or so. Let others know of your concern. This is probably the hardest uh, for me and for most of us to simply talk about this with, with um, people around us. Um, it is not a subject which lends itself to easy conversation. People may well look at you a little oddly if you bring it up um, out of context with the conversation. But nonetheless, it is in the back of their minds. It legitimizes the issue if they know that you are concerned about it too. Consider the directions of giving money all of our main concerns, as we said, won't be there if we don't manage to handle this one. Dick Gregory, whom you may remember, a black wit and philosopher, a, a comic, uh, was challenged because he was giving time to the uh, nuclear threat concern. Why aren't you marching for black power? And he said, if I march in the morning for black power and they drop the bomb at noon, there won't be anything to march for in the evening. Make your views clear to elected officials. Express direct, clear feelings and thoughts. And ordinarily, one keeps it simple and brief. And you don't have to know everything. My daughter said not long ago, I started to write a letter to Mr. Reagan, but she said, I realized I didn't really know enough about it. And I said, Mary, dear child, you don't have to have uh, a bibliography and footnotes. It really is simply a, a, a message of how you feel and think. And tell them that this is the number one issue on which you will grade them at election time. Get local and state and federal officials involved. As you probably know, there are 446 New England town meetings who have passed the uh, nuclear freeze resolution. New England is not noted as a hotbed of liberalism. 446 New England town meetings, 232 city councils, 52 county councils, 18 state legislative bodies have endorsed the freeze proposal. Organize a discussion group session. Work for specific, realistic objectives. And at the moment, perhaps the clearest single objective is the passage of the freeze resolution. Get out and be counted. And this is a new experience for all of us in middle America. I want to end up with um, a very brief uh, bit of what Roger Fisher, who had the fantasy about the knife, said to us at the end of a full day symposium in Seattle uh, two years ago on this subject. After a whole day of this, you can well imagine that you're a grease spot on the floor. But he picked us up and empowered us at the end of the day. And a little of what he said was, I see no reason to be gloomy about saving the world. There is more exhilaration, more challenge, more zest in tilting at windmills than in any routine job. Be involved, not intellectually, but emotionally. Here's a chance to work together with affection, with caring.
mother or a merchant. We are human beings. Be human. People have struggled, he said, all their lives to clear 10 acres of ground or simply maintain themselves and their families. Look at the opportunity we have. Few people in history have been given such a chance, a chance to apply our convictions, our highest moral goals with such competence as our skills may give us, a chance to work with others, to have the satisfaction that comes from playing a role, however small, in a constructive enterprise. What challenge could be greater? We have an opportunity to improve the chance of human survival. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I am happy to report that Dr. McGrath does not have to catch a plane, and therefore we will have time for questions. Uh, Dr. McGrath, I think the first question has already come from the audience that I will try to paraphrase, and then we'll take other questions. During your presentation, you indicated that uh, you were talking about a percentage of the budget that goes for defense, and I believe it's a specific uh, type of appropriation. And would you please clarify what percentage that was? We have to divide the budget uh, into fixed obligations, uh, which really are, are not, um, not amendable, they're not changeable. And these include uh, uh, such things as Social Security and uh, uh, pensions to families of veterans of previous wars, all kinds of pensions to governmental employees. Um, and this, this is a, a, a major <coughs> part of our budget. But of the portion of the budget, which is variable and, uh, and decided by congressional action uh, and debate and decision uh, yearly, of that discretionary portion, 78% goes to support the military. Now, this is, is not just nuclear weapons, obviously. Nuclear weapons are not the largest part of our military budget by, by a long way. Uh, it includes everything that has to do with any part of our military, its existence, its, its uh, uh, equipment, its salaries, uh, research and development, um, and, and so on. Um, this, this is the uh, current figure. Uh, the question is uh, the advisability of presenting this kind of scenario to, to children, to young children. Um, I certainly would not present this kind of material in this way to, to a group of young children. But I think we do have to remember that relatively young children have repeatedly been found to be clearly aware of the nuclear threat and to be concerned and to be frightened about it. And all of us know that those things which are, are left unanswered, un, unrelated to other people, with which we feel we deal alone, uh, create a good deal more anxiety, more fear and concern than those things which we share and uh, uh, can um, uh, discuss with other people. So that I think that, that um, gradually we're, we're beginning to work our way toward how to present this best to children. They can't really be left out without doing them a disservice. And yet they can't be given this kind of information. They don't have the background for it. Um, May 18th in Seattle, uh, Judy Lipton, who has for several years been president of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility and another psychiatrist, from the area are going to talk about how to talk to children about nuclear war. And I will go and listen very uh, avidly. But um, 
I think one thing is, is true, and that is that we feel better about anxieties if we know that they are shared, that we aren't alone. We feel better about anxieties if we do something about it. Uh, this is true for us, too, that one answer to depression, and I think we all have a, a certain measure of depression about this, is action. And uh, for children to know that there are people who are working very hard to keep this from, from being a threat, and particularly if they can know that there are 